very much, Magdalena, and thanks for having me. Um, I would love to say it's a great day for data protection, but I'm not sure <laughs> I can compete with the sunshine outside. Um, but today I've been asked to um, discuss key innovations under the GDPR with you. Now, obviously, that's an incredibly broad topic, so um, I've narrowed it down quite considerably. Uh, so I'm going to focus today on the principle of accountability as an innovation and also on the right to data portability as an innovation. But just to get started or by way of background context, um, I think I would concur here with the words of Peter Hustings, the former European Data Protection Supervisor, when he said that the GDPR is more about continuity than it is about change. And the reason why I say that there is because if you look at the basic legal framework and the structure and the layout of that framework, under the Data Protection Directive and the same framework under the GDPR, you'll see that the structure remains identical. So you have a system of checks and balances that data controllers must respect in order to process personal data, and then a system of rights given to data subjects who can exercise those rights vis-a-vis -vis data controllers. So the GDPR, like the Data Protection Directive, um, has principles that must be complied with uh, in order for data processing to be legitimate, and the idea that a data controller always needs to show that they have a legal basis for data processing. So all of that core infrastructure remains the same under the GDPR as it did under the Data Protection Directive. So when you're looking at innovations under the GDPR, personally I think the major innovations come kind of at the back end in terms of enforcement of the data protection principles. And here I think this, this change was very much needed. Um, the, the book or the monograph that uh, Madalena mentioned was a monograph called The Foundations of Data Protection Law, which looked at the role of individual control over personal data in the EU data protection system. And the main argument advanced there is that it is problematic from a rights protection perspective to put too much onus on the individual to protect or to um, ensure the effective application of their own rights in the digital environment. So in other words, informational self-determination or individual control over personal data is an essential element of the data protection regime, but other elements are needed in order to ensure effective protection of individuals. And many of those additional elements have been built into the GDPR. And here I think the most attention has been paid to the fines, for instance, that data controllers might um, be subject to should they breach the, the GDPR. And also the possibility for collective actors like civil society organisations to take collective claims against data controllers or collective complaints to supervisory authorities in order to ensure the effectiveness of rights. So those kind of headlines have been getting a lot of attention. But equally important here is, I think, the principle of accountability, which is um, an explicit recognition that we need to take some of the burden off individuals um, to enforce their own rights and place a little bit more responsibility back on data controllers. So as I said, I'll briefly outline the, the principle of accountability this morning, which includes and is intrinsically linked to um, principles of transparency and principles of fairness. Now, in the interest of time, it's absolutely impossible to go through each and every step in, uh, or each and every element of accountability in the GDPR, so I will focus on transparency and fairness. But then also, if we were to look at the rights granted to data subjects under the GDPR, I think it's fair to say that the only truly um, innovative or truly new right is the right to data portability contained in Article 20 of the GDPR. So that's where we are lacking in any concrete guidance, aside from the very good guidelines of the Article 29 Working Party, on how this right should be applied in practice. So I'll also spend some time discussing that. So if we turn then to the principle of uh, accountability, well, here... Uh, as a starting point for this presentation, I went to Rosemary Jay, who's a very uh, well-known, well-respected data protection practitioner's um, introduction to the GDPR. And you see there that Rosemary Jay states that um, there is no wide-reaching or settled agreement 
on what exactly accountability means. So we have precedent for a principle of accountability in data protection systems um, dating back to 1980 in the OECD privacy principles. The OECD privacy principle number eight states, uh, sets out a principle of accountability. However, there was no explicit reference to accountability in the data protection directive. So in some ways we're, we're in new, potentially unfamiliar territory here. And so what Rosemary Jay and her co-authors recommend is that when trying to delineate or define what exactly the principle of accountability entails, we should look at the principles and the articles in the regulation as, uh, and the accompanying recitals, of course, as a form of coherent code. So you're not going to find any one um, clear definition of accountability wherever you look in the regulation. She also argues that the introduction of this principle of accountability could be looked at as a concrete step in, um, on this path towards uh, more ethical principles that are being applied to data processing. So, for instance, in 2014, the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, started to push for an ethics advisory board at EU level to look at ethical dimensions and develop an ethical framework for data processing that would sit alongside um, or accompany the, the general data protection regulation itself. And so accountability is, I guess, a principle that sits somewhere in between um, that ethical framework and then the, the hard or black letter of the law, if you could ever say that the black letter of the GDPR is entirely clear. Um, so with that in mind, you could look and, and consider what types of um, elements are generally required in a regulatory regime that is based on the principle of accountability. And uh, here again, you see uh, Jay and co-authors kind of saying, well, here uh, we need mutual standards and objectives in a, in a legislative framework that are agreed by all stakeholders. Uh, you need clear allocation of responsibility. So here that would mean clear allocation of responsibility in the context of joint controllership of data or um, between controllers and data processors. Um, you require transparency. You need to show compliance with standards and then you need to have um, effective redress and sanctions. So when you look at that list, you basically see that accountability is the kitchen sink. It's, you know, it's, it's flexible and it's whatever <laughs> you want it to be. It, it means compliance with the law, demonstrable compliance with the law and a effective redress afterwards. So then making that a little bit more concrete in the context of the GDPR, I think there are two provisions that really act as cornerstones for the principle of accountability. So the first is Article 5.2 of the GDPR, and um, that is the kind of catch-all provision that applies to all of the safeguards, uh, or the principles as they're now called, for personal data processing. So you know that in order for data processing to be lawful, you need to comply with a number of safeguards, including things like data minimization, data deletion, uh, purpose limitation, all of these safeguards need to be complied with. And they're all set out in Article 5.1 of the regulation. What you see underneath that provision in Article 5.2 is this new um, provision, which states that the controller shall be responsible for and be able to demonstrate compliance with these principles that are set out in Article 5.1. So that is the accountability principle as it applies in the context of those safeguards. And first thing to note is that that is broader, for instance, than the OECD privacy principle in Provision 8, because the OECD privacy principle talks about um, ensuring compliance with but it doesn't have this kind of evidential requirement, you might say. So the idea that you need to have adequate record keeping in, in order to be able to demonstrate your compliance. So that is kind of baked into the GDPR now, not simply compliance, but the ability to evidence that compliance. Um, one thing to note here though, is that although we have this new principle, there is no standalone fine for a failure to comply with Article 5.2. There is simply a standalone fine that applies to the failure to comply with Article 
And so many commentators have argued here that this means that accountability is some sort of general exhortation or general plea with controllers rather than a type of legally enforceable obligation. Now you might say, well that's because for each of the accountability provisions that you see in the regulation, which are not necessarily labelled as such, there is then a, an accompanying fine. But for instance, if I, were, if I were to make decisions about data deletion um, as a data controller, and I'm thinking, okay, that's in order to comply with the principle of data minimization, and somebody challenged me on that basis, it does seem that, if, that I wouldn't necessarily have to show um, a complete record of my decision making about data minimization for Article 5.2 to be complied with or to not uh, attract a fine. But there is, however, again, in, in a bit of repetition, which if you're familiar with the regulation, you'll know is a, a common problem. With a bit of repetition, there is a, a record keeping provision in Article 30 of the GDPR as well. So arguably by repeating, we've kind of covered all bases in, in that regard. So that's the, the first provision, Article 5.2. There's also Article 24.1 which is explicitly labelled the responsibility of the controller or responsibility of the controller. And effectively what Article 24.1 is doing is requiring data controllers uh, to undertake a contextual assessment of their data processing activities and also to conduct a risk assessment of data processing activities and then on the back of those assessments, that contextual and risk-based assessment, to implement um, appropriate technical and organisational measures, and again, um, to be able to demonstrate that their processing is compatible with the regulation. And this is, as you can see from the last sentence of Article 24.1, an, a kind of an active obligation. So um, it's an active obligation because the measures need to be reviewed and updated where necessary. So a few comments on this responsibility of the controller. The first is that you can see here that um, I see, the notion of accountability is intrinsically linked to um, the introduction of a more risk-based um, regulatory approach to data processing. So you could say, if you, looked at the data, if you looked at the Data Protection Directive, you could perhaps argue that there are already elements of a risk-based approach there. For instance, you could argue that if you looked at the legal basis um, for data processing that was based on legitimate interests, that required controllers to consider whether they had a legitimate interest in data processing and that, that interest would not, their interest would not lead to an adverse effect on the rights and interests of data subjects. So you could say there, well, there's an element of risk assessment inbuilt into that Article 7F balancing obligation. And that's certainly true, but I would also argue that the Data Protection Directive was also um, quite a precautionary approach. So we were never trying to pinpoint exactly what risks the regulatory framework was seeking to address. Um, whereas now in the regulation you have that thank you you have that risk regulatory approach made more explicit and it's made more explicit in a number of ways um, for instance article 7 or recital 75 of the regulation makes an attempt a very brave attempt i would say because it's a challenging task but a brave attempt to um, identify the risks inherent or the potential risks that follow from personal data processing. Um, it also says the controllers should take into account the likelihood and severity of risks when um, they are carrying out data processing. And you see that this risk is then um, inbuilt into many of the provisions in the regulation that encourage the accountability of controllers. One thing to absolutely emphasize here, and it's probably already clear, is that before the regulation was adopted, so after the initial commission proposal in 2012, there was an extensive debate about the desirability of introducing a risk-based approach to personal data processing. The concern here was um, largely a fundamental rights one, that um, if a controller made a self-assessment that particular operations were not um, risky, 
then those set of operations would fall outside of the scope of the rules and individuals would be left with no recourse. However, I guess that's to, to misunderstand in many ways the role of risk in this regulatory framework. So risk here is not used as a threshold for the application of the rules. So low risk processing operations don't fall outside of the rules. All relevant data processing operations fall inside the scope of the rules. But then when it comes to the extent of the obligations, once you're within the scope of the rules, the extent of the obligations under the rules differ depending on whether or not your data processing operations are high risk or low risk. So this has been um, the argument that the GDPR won't necessarily um, bankrupt SMEs, for instance, because if you're a corner shop that's not processing much data, the rules will still apply to you, but because you're doing lower risk data processing operations or minimal data processing operations, the, your, your record keeping, for instance, won't need to be um, to the same standard as if you were Google processing personal data in the context of its search engine. So that's how risk has then panned out. But you can see that the idea of risk is, goes hand in hand with accountability, simply because data controllers need to assess risk. And if they get that wrong, <laughs> then the accountability principle may kick in. Um, and they could be held, uh, if they get that wrong, and it's their, their thought process is inadequately documented, then that could be a breach of the principle of, of accountability. So, as I said, there's no checklist of provisions in the GDPR that relate directly to accountability. But you might say that accountability is relevant um, in all of these provisions that are listed on this slide. And as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these provisions. Uh, I think you'll see tomorrow, uh, or you'll, you'll hear a little bit more tomorrow on data protection impact assessments, for instance, in practice. But you can see that um, accountability is evident in these provisions because things like record keeping demonstrate compliance with the principle of accountability. The two provisions or the two elements of accountability that I'll focus on a little are transparency and fairness. And so if I turn first to transparency, well, the first thing to note here is that um, transparency means providing adequate information to data subjects, to individuals. This is not a new requirement under the GDPR. If you looked at, for instance, um, the requirement for consent to be lawful under the Data Protection Directive, the individual has to be well informed. Uh, therefore, information was a prerequisite for that condition to be fulfilled. What you will see here is that you, you've got transparency explicitly listed now um, out on its own as a standalone principle. So if you see Article 12.1, it says appropriate measures need, um, are needed to provide information in a concise, transparent, intelligible and easily accessible form using clear and plain language and that needs to be tailored to the particular audience that you are addressing your information to. So the Article 29 Working Party has recently published guidelines on transparency under the GDPR and they provide, they flesh out this um, condition quite well. So you see in the condition, for instance, that, or in the recitals it stipulates that the information can be provided by any appropriate means including electronically or orally. Uh, here, for instance, the Article 29 Working Party has said that um, the oral provision of information might suffice for Article 12, but it won't suffice for Articles 13 and uh, 14. So in many ways, an oral provision of information would need to sit on top of any other way in which information is provided. So to take an example of that, if you have a digital butler, a kind of like Siri or something in your um, home, then it might be appropriate in that context for Siri to provide your data protection guidance or your data protection information orally in the first time you turn the machine on. However, if there are subsequent changes to that information, all of that would need to, I think, be provided 
uh, in writing as well in order to comply with Articles 13 and 14. So, as I said, the additional information requirements, so more elaboration on what precise information you need to provide, is set out in Article 13 and 14. Now, this contains some obvious um, information like the identity of the data controller, the contact details of a data protection officer if the data controller has a DPO, um, an assessment of the legal basis that's used for data processing, an assessment of um, compatibility with relevant safeguards. So it provides quite a lot of information to the data subject. As a result, we're clearly again in the territory um, of one of the major shortcomings of the Data Protection Directive, which is that data controllers provided um, tons of information to data subjects and they simply clicked yes or the information washed over them uh, because it was an information deluge or information overload. So the Article 29 Working Party and other industry stakeholders or representative organisations and I think here of um, the Centre for Information Leadership and Policy, or Policy and Leadership at Hunton and Williams, who have very good guidelines on accountability and transparency. Well, they have said here something appropriate might be the introduction of layered privacy notices, um, where you contain, you, you set out the basics um, on, for instance, a homepage of a website or whatever, what, in whatever manifestation the information first becomes available for you. But if you want to get more information, then you would click through on hyperlinks in order to get more and more information. So that then helps to reconcile these competing tensions between, on the one hand, adequately informing the, the relevant individual, and on the other hand, not completely bombarding them with information that they're not going to be able to take in. So information is there if needed, but you have to kind of pick it out a little bit more. And so the Article 29 Working Party guidelines are actually great at, um, as I said, fleshing out these requirements that are still at a relatively abstract level in, in the regulation itself. So I'm not going to go into all of the specific um, information requirements, but one thing I think is striking, or one thing that struck me perhaps because of current research interests, is um, in Article 14, you, so Article 13 of the regulation deals with the information that needs to be provided to the data subject at the point um, of contact, so when the information is directly acquired from the data subject. Article 14 deals with the information that needs to be provided to the data subject when um, the relationship between the entity that's processing the information and the individual is not direct. So if I give my personal data to the LSE, under uh, Article uh, 13, the LSE will need to provide me with a certain amount of information about what it's going to do with that. If the LSE then transfers that data to um, the regulatory body for universities in the UK, then that would be, they would be subject to the Article 14 requirements because they haven't directly acquired that information from me. It should be immediately appar apparent then that this is the provision that would apply when data brokers are um, processing personal data. And obviously data brokers and the agreements between uh, primary data controllers and um, related contro uh, processors of information have been in the news quite a lot recently as a result of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica um, debacle for want of a better word. Um, and so the question here is will this, will this Will the, the general processing of individuals' information be more transparent <laughs> post uh, GDPR or after the 25th of May? Uh, and here you see that there are a couple of additional obligations that apply when you obtain data indirectly. So for instance, um, the data broker, if we take that example, will need to indicate where they got this information from. So if an entity that I have never had direct contact with is processing my personal information, then they will be under an information obligation to tell me where they got that data. So they must indicate the source of the personal data. So presuming you have the wherewithal to kind of track down who is processing your data, then you would be able to require that information from them. 
The timing of disclosure is normally within one month, and I won't go into that. Uh, what I think is important here, and what I think will be important in terms of future litigation and future interpretation, is that there are exemptions to this requirement that you must indicate where you have obtained your data from. And they are in the case of impossibility, and the Article 29 Working Party there says either something is impossible or it's not impossible, clearly. <laughs> and so um, that would be kind of an absolute failure to be able to identify the relevant individual to provide them with this information. Or, and this is where things might get more interesting for data brokers, where it would involve disproportionate effort. So this, has, this is a potential loophole or back, back, uh, back road into extensive data processing by data brokers. Uh, the Article 29 Working Party, as you might imagine, is arguing that because this is an exception to a right set out in the legislative framework and you know, general EU law, exceptions to rights must be construed narrowly. Therefore, um, there are a number of limits on the use of this um, exception. So the Article 29 Working Party says, for instance, that this can only be used um, where the reason why it's disproportionate to inform the data subject is because the information has not been obtained directly. And also, and I, I agree with the sentiment here, but it says the exception cannot be um, relied upon or routinely relied upon by the data controllers. That's in paragraph 55 of um, the Article 29 Working Party's opinion. So clearly that's a very strict interpretation of the exemption by the Article 29 Working Party which, keep in mind, will de facto become the European Data Protection Board in May, um, and whose decisions are open to appeal. So I can imagine that that could be a point of contention, to what extent data brokers, for instance, will be able to rely on this exception um, after that point. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there with, with transparency. Just one other thing I want to um, highlight is we have, again, in the regulation, the principle of fairness. And uh, if you look at a lot of the stakeholder materials here, a link is often made between this general principle of fairness and the principle of accountability. The issue, so, and so again, Rosemary Jay would say, there's no indication that this principle of fairness set out in Article 501A of the GDPR departs from the principle of fairness that was in the Data Protection Directive. The issue here is that we haven't had um, very much case law challenging or jurisprudence at national level, challenging data processing simply on the grounds that it is unfair. And so you might say um, that, for instance, could be used to challenge the practices of data, broker, uh, data brokers even if um, Article 13 or Article 14 was, was construed narrowly. Um, and I just want to highlight that the, the, this notion of fairness, because it hasn't had very much traction in uh, data protection law, even though it is a very kind of long standing principle. So, you know, if you go back in the UK to 1978, you have the, the Alindop report, which introduces fairness in data processing, and it talks about fairness as kind of a two pronged. Um, a two-pronged uh, principle, one of openness, so transparency, but the other um, of the idea that you shouldn't take advantage of disparities of power. So you can see that that's a very open textured principle and we're unclear um, how it will be applied or whether it will be kind of operationalized under the GDPR. Um, if anybody's interested in that further, there's an excellent article that's available on SSRN by uh, Damien Clifford and Jeff Ausley's on fairness in data protection law. But just a further point to note is because we've seen, um, we've seen very little application of this principle at domestic level or at European level, the, there has been a call by the European Data Protection Supervisor, which is seemingly being taken up at national level throughout the EU, for data protect, or sorry, for uh, consumer protection authorities to look at uh, data processing contracts, particularly digital consumer, obviously business to consumer contracts in the online world under consumer protection law, but equally we're seeing competition authorities start to investigate uh, digital giants 
on the basis that the terms and conditions that are being offered to users are an abuse of dominant position because they are exploitative and exploitative abuses under competition law are unfair practices. So um, even if data processing is compliant with the letter of data protection law, it seems that that principle of fairness, the broader principle of fairness is being used in other regulatory frameworks. Um, in order to effectively sanction the same practices that will be sanctioned under data protection law. Now, you might think that is um, regulators having man many uh, you know, bites at the same cherry and therefore is unjust, or you might simply say you need that kind of holistic approach and cooperation between regulators to effectively ensure rights. And I am going to here plug um, something I'm working on. So there'll be a special symposium edition of international data privacy law the, the OUP journal on exactly this issue, so the intersection between data protection and competition that will be published in, in, in July. And that issue of fairness will be appearing in, in two or three articles that will be published there. But I think that also has the potential to be an interesting development. So, sorry, then if we turn to the right to data portability, so that's all I'm going to say on accountability. And more briefly on the, on the right to data portability, so you'll find the text of this right um, on, or it, in Article 20 of the GDPR and then on this slide. Um, so what does it say? It's, so this is the right that has been tr described as kind of the brand new, truly innovative right. Uh, now many have questioned whether this is simply building on the right of access to personal data. So what does portability entail? It means you have a right to access your data and to have it transferred to, from one data controller to another data controller. And that transfer can be direct, where, as you can see here on the bottom line, um, technically feasible. So the controllers, if it's technically feasible for them, will have to do transfers from one to the other. However, I would suggest that this right is not simply a kind of an add-on or a bolt-on to the right of access. Why? Because it's narrower in scope. So I'll talk about that now. So first of all, I've just picked out a few elements of data portability that I think are interesting and have not yet been uh, well, confirmed before courts, obviously. So first of all, um, the data have to be provided by the data subject. So it's not all personal data that will fall within the scope of data portability. It's data provided by the data subject. So you might say the right of access is therefore broader because it applies to all personal data um, of the data subjects. So what does provided by mean? Again, here you've got um, Article 29 guidelines on data portability that are quite um, detailed and quite helpful. So you see the Article 29 Working Party distinguishes on the one hand between data provided by the data subject, so actively provided. So if I have, for instance, a, a Fitbit um, smart um, watch slash fitness device, then um, the data I originally input about my height and weight and gender and all of this will be clearly data I have provided. The Article 29 Working Party says also data that is observed will be looked at as data provided by the data subject. So how often I go running or um, what kind of, uh, how many steps I take per day would therefore fall within that definition of provided by, even though I haven't kind of actively transmitted that information, you could argue. Um, however, inferred data or the analytics based on that, that information, so for instance, Fitbit's general assessment of my fitness or lack thereof um, would be outside of the scope of the right to data portability. This is also interesting because you could think that um, in the digital environment, things like profiles of individuals as sellers on particular sites or as hosts on other sites um, are not necessarily data they have provided. So um, reviews, for instance, of my capacity as an Airbnb host would not be data I have provided, which is why um, you see in the European Commission question whether or not we need uh, data portability for non-personal data, because that would also mean that you would have th those transfers of data um, covered as well under portability. A suggestion that for the moment has been rejected for reasons I'll elaborate on. So 
first limitation is that it has to be provided by the data subject. There's a question mark here over whether this means interoperability. If you look at Recital 68, it's a bit of a mess. So on the one hand, it kind of lauds interoperability as something that data controllers should be um, pursuing, but then says that they're encouraged to do so, but um, not obliged, basically. So what does that mean? Um, well, interoperability here would mean that technical systems can um, interact seamlessly. So not just the data can be transferred from one to the other, but that if a if another social network existed um, apart from Facebook, that if I were a Facebook user and um, my friends were on the fictitious other network, then we could communicate seamlessly across those networks. Um, so that type of interoperability has not been mandated. Personally, I think that's a good thing from a privacy perspective, as I'll talk about. Um, the data then have to be in a commonly used format. And um, here, a lot more work needs to be done, uh, technical specifications on what exactly that commonly used format would be. And from an innovation perspective, there are clearly concerns here that, uh, that I'll, I'll outline in a minute. And then, in some ways, you could argue that this right to data portability is very broad in scope. So, in, it's narrower than the right of access because the data have to be provided by the data subject and also, sorry, something that I should have emphasized is that the legal basis for the data processing has to be consent or contract. So if, for instance, a controller is processing personal data on the basis of legitimate interests, then that data does not fall within the scope of portability. So you could say if a data controller wanted to be a bit sneaky, possibly breaching the principle of fairness, <laughs> it would siphon off um, it would, it would rely on um, the legitimate interest legal basis for, for data processing rather than consent in order to dodge data portability. Um, but as I said, that would, in my opinion, be an unfair practice. Um, but you could say it's broad in scope insofar as it's not sector specific. So the EU and the Philippines are the only countries, or the only, sorry, Freudian slip, um, are the only uh, legal entities <laughs> that um, have sorry, not yeah, the Philippines, yeah, have, have enacted a general right to data portability. So we see manifestations of data portability at national level in many states. So, for instance, Obama had kind of pioneered um, this My Data program um, for, sectors, for specific sectors. So you could get your tax data um, or you could get your energy data. In the UK, My Data is a, is a banking initiative. Um, primarily, so in, operating in the financial sector. But this is the first cross-sectoral right to data portability applicable um, across the board. So then what's the thinking behind this? Well, I would say the thinking is, could be twofold. So all of those other initiatives I've just mentioned are approaching data portability from a consumer protection perspective. And the argument there is that if you give consumers um, portability over their mobile phone number, then they will become more empowered consumers because they'll be able to compare the market and to move to um, more competitive offerings. So you've got this empowerment of consumers and the reason why that's attractive or why you might empower consumers is because you lower the switching costs. It becomes easier for consumers to move from one um, provider to another. So you could say, well, that's clearly the rationale for the portability requirements um, in, in the GDPR. Similarly, at a more macro perspective, um, there was a lot of discussion in council about whether or not it was appropriate to include a right to data portability in the regulation. The argument for those who were opposed was that data portability is a competition right, and therefore it's, it sits um, uncomfortably in a human rights or data protection framework. Um, and th so th the reason why data portability might be a competition right is because um, it could reduce barriers to entry to particular markets. So if you are a service that is reliant on vast quantities of data in order to compete, then in, you might want to be able to extract that consumer data from your competitors and to attract those competitors over in order to even gain a foothold in the market. So in that way, it could be a competitive issue. But equally, you could say here, this might um, facilitate innovation for products that don't yet exist. 
So um, the UK regulator is very excited, or the, the, when the My Data initiative was launched in the UK, there was a lot of excitement about it because the idea was that it would facilitate price comparisons, for instance. So you could get your data from your energy provider, you could input that data to a price comparison website, and it would, on the basis of your historic transactions, be able to tell you where you might get the most competitive offer or the best value for your money. Um, so we, you could look at it from that perspective as a competition or a consumer protection right. Competition lawyers are therefore very, and I sorry that's a general, a broad sweep, uh, but um, there's been some critical comment from some competition lawyers who've been working on this about the scope of the right to data portability. Because they argue that it is not necessarily an economically efficient right. Um, that it might in fact lead to inefficiencies in markets rather than the benefits or the assumed benefits that I've just outlined. Um, so for I guess the most damning version of that there's an article by Swire and Lagos that's available in SSRN. So why do I say this? Well they say the right as it applies in competition law is a lot narrower or more narrow. So if you look at something like Microsoft where Microsoft was obliged to um, provide interoperability information to its competitors. There were a couple of preconditions to that um, obligation of portability. One was that Microsoft had a dominant position on the market. So this was only applying to the big dominant players, whereas our right to data portability applies to SMEs, as it does to Google. Um, and that then that dominant position had to be abused. Uh, equally, you could say, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but for instance, that this right to data portability might lock in particular formats of, um, so you said, you could see on the previous slide, the data has to be provided in a, in a commonly used format. Well, um, that might mean two things, that particular formats are used for longer than is efficient, and therefore you might not have innovation. And also there's a risk there that the big players will get to determine what those formats are to the exclusion of smaller players. So this could actually make, entail barriers to entry then for new operators. So the economic efficiency of data portability is questionable. And I think this is implicitly recognized in the Commission's 2017 communication on uh, building a European data economy. Uh, because there the Commission looks at whether or not we should have a right to data portability for non-personal data, and it effectively concludes that the jury's out from an economic perspective as to whether or not that would be beneficial. So that means if we're not looking at data portability as an economically, you know, as a right that, that entails efficiencies, we need to look at it from a human rights perspective, which I would argue is consistent with the other rights that you have in the GDPR. So this is in my opinion, purely and simply, a right that seeks to enhance individual control over personal data. And uh, you can see that mentioned in the recitals. And I think the Article 29 Working Party had issued first um, guidelines for discussion uh, on data portability and then subsequently changed those guidelines, I think, to reflect this fact. So, um, the, and I say they did that because there was a, a sentence in the first set of guidelines that said that primary aim of portability is to facilitate switching. That is now gone. <laughs> Data portability is a human rights matter, thank you very much. Um, and uh, there's an attempt to kind of differentiate data, data portability, uh, data protection and competition. So you could look at this as the kind of newest manifestation of the idea of individual control over personal data or informational self-determination. That might seem very academic, possibly is, um, but I think this could have practical repercussions. For instance, um, I'm based in the UK, uh, post-Brexit, once we have some clarity on that, if the UK is um, not adopting something that looks like the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, so Labour, for instance, have been pushing for a right to data protection in the UK, if that right to data protection is absent, then there's a query over whether the UK will need to interpret the rights in the regulation through a human rights lens. So it could be open for the UK regulator to say, we want to interpret the rights in the regulation through an economic lens rather than through a human rights lens. And then you could end up with a narrower definition of portability than under this kind of 
human rights perspective. At least that's, I, I guess, my opinion on that. Um, so what challenges then will we see with this? And I'm conscious of run over time, but um, just very briefly, uh, portability, in my opinion, could be problematic because it, again, pushes the onus or the responsibility onto individuals to um, exercise their own rights. And if you look at the impact assessments in the UK on my data, so dating, dating from 2011, you see that they talk about a potential poverty premium there. So people who are well-informed, well-read, um, active in exercising their rights will shop around and get better deals and have more control over their information. Those who don't have those privileges will not have that control. So it, this could be an inequality-inducing in, uh, provision. There's some confusion about how the right operates, and that's an article that talks about this, although it's based on a quite limited data set. But when you get your information from a controller, you also need to ask the controller to delete your information unless you simply want the information duplicated. So data portability doesn't have inbuilt in the letter of the law a, 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 um, an ensuing or a um, bundled right to delete. Again, you might say if a data controller, well, and I don't, I don't know whether a data controller could assume that, that obligation to delete because maybe the individual simply wants to back up their files. <laughs> and so um, there's some confusion at individual level about what exactly portability means. So some individuals in user groups seem to assume that if you port your data from one controller to another, then it will be automatically deleted. So that would be something where you need a lot of advocacy to, to highlight that. And then... James Grimmelman in the US talks about um, portability, well, rather interoperability. So interoperability, as I said, is not a requirement of portability, but it's something that's encouraged. But if you have interoperability, he talks about a privacy race to the bottom. So um, you would then um, potentially rule out the fact that controllers would compete on the basis of the level of privacy that they offer individuals. And if you have, for instance, if I'm using my fictitious social networking service and my friends are using Facebook, whose privacy policy prevails there? You're going to go to the lowest common de denominator of privacy policy, and therefore, that's why he says there's a potential for a race to the, to the bottom here. And then finally, from feasibility challenge, and I have very little technical um, knowledge, but you have clear data security risks here. How do you identify who the relevant data subject is? Um, so how do you confirm authentication of identity? Um, will individuals, once they have this kind of treasure trove of data on their PC, will they be able to adequately secure it themselves? So you might argue that it's better off in the hands of um, a controller. Um, and how do you secure the actual process of transferring the data from one controller to the other? So against potential hacking or interceptions at that point. Um, Okay, so just to sum up on data portability, I think two points are, are noteworthy here. First is that this is a truly new and innovative right, and so we don't have very much empirical information about how it's going to be taken up, whether it will be taken up, and how it will be applied in practice. And then, as I said, I think these differing rationales that could be brought forward to justify portability could be relevant, um, not necessarily within the EU context, where the GDPR is clearly anchored to Article 7 and 8 of the Charter, but outside of um, the European Union, where you might not have um, a similar fundamental rights framework. So I'll stop there, and I apologise for running over. <laughs>